so hello to everybody out there. Uh, I don't know whether it's uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on where you might be. It's just after 3 p.m. in London, and as you can imagine, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cold and grey outside, uh, which is something us Brits have to get used to on a regular basis. Um, okay, let me start by thanking you for being here today. Uh, this is my first ever webinar, um, and it's great to see so many participants. There's just, just short of 300 now. Um, and I hope we'll get through with no major technical or presentational, presentational hitches. Um, I'd also like to thank Macmillan for inviting me to give this webinar and being able to prepare a talk on such a great topic and a teaching technique I passionately encourage. Uh, I'd also like to thank our technical moderator, Henry, uh, who's obviously with us today, who you've just seen and heard from, not Caroline. And he will do his very best to deal with your technical queries. And just to reiterate what Henry said, Julia is another moderator online who can answer any questions about one-stop English as well for you. So let's put our attention straight onto slide one. Uh, sharing stories um, is my webinar and the creative potential of storytelling in EFL. So above all else, the core objective of today's webinar is to encourage you to bring storytelling into your classrooms and to demonstrate the creative potential of storytelling through practical lesson ideas that you can go off and explore with your learners. So, just a quick note on the slides. I will be sharing a number of links during the webinar, which you can note down during the session if you wish to, but we will be sending the slides to all participants in a follow-up email after the webinar. So if you miss any of those links, don't worry. Um, okay. First, uh, a little about me before we get started. My name is Luke Viner. Uh, I'm a teacher and teacher trainer. I currently teach EFL to teenagers and adults, plus Spanish as a second language to primary school children. And although the experience of both age groups is vastly different, I, I approach both in largely similar ways. And storytelling, with all the varieties and techniques available to a teacher, is something I use with both. So today, however, I will be focusing just on EFL. OK. Secondly, but by no means less importantly, actually, I'll just get you to slide two so you can see that information there. I run an educational audio production and course design company called London Language Experience with my brother James, who is also the co-author of most of the material I write. Together we produce a range of teaching materials for EFL, but we specialize in audio resources. So as you can see in slide two, I've shared a link to our website, our website rather, www.londonlanguageexperience.com. Um, and I've also shown you the many ways you can contact me. So if you want to tweet about the webinar, please do so. And if you have any comments or questions, I will be able to look at those after we've finished. You can contact me at LLE Luke on Facebook or luke at londonlanguageexperience.com um, via email. OK, so what else is there to tell you? I'm also gladly representing One Stop English at this year's IATEFL in Liverpool, where I will be running a workshop on using sound as a stimulus for language learning in EFL. So if you're coming along to that, perhaps we'll have a chance to meet in person and share some stories. OK. Mm. Myself and James are very proud to have produced one of the most popular listening skills series in One Stop's history uh, called The Ghost's Guide to London, which is part audio play, part audio guide to the city. To find this series, just go to the cinematic listening section on One Stop English, or you can follow the link at the bottom of the current slide. Um, the first lesson um, is based around Camden and is available for free, but the others require subscription, uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, we are now in the midst of creating a totally new and exciting second series, so keep an eye out for that. We have coined our listening material as cinematic. To create a cinematic listening experience, we use immersive 3D sound effects, original music scores, and a group of very talented actors to produce listening material that we believe draws the listener in and enables our listening passages to be extended and really demonstrate just how powerful sound effects and soundscapes can be. For anyone who's unsure of what a soundscape is, 
Our soundscape is a layer of sound effects, often with music as well, to create a scene. As well as both being the authors of the content and teaching plans we produce, we also see ourselves as digital storytellers. We use sound effects, soundscapes, original music, and pre-recorded narration to tell our tales. We believe that stories bring language to life and they encourage creativity. At the heart of our resources is the art of storytelling and the idea that sharing stories is how we learn. It's how we all interact socially. What do you do? Where do you live? What's your story, etc. It doesn't matter if you're telling an off-the-cuff anecdote or a prepared digital story using sophisticated software, the process is much the same. You are expressing yourself and personalising language to entertain, explain, shock, amuse, educate, and so on. Which brings us nicely to the next slide. We are all, in a sense, storytellers. The self is given content. It is delineated and embodied, primarily in narrative constructions or stories. With storytelling, you have the receptive but also productive potentiality and we see both of equal importance. Which finally brings us to today's webinar, all about storytelling in EFL, which will begin with an interactive storytelling lesson of a psychological nature, a brief history of storytelling in EFL, if there is such a thing, a section on the benefits of storytelling, some creative lesson ideas for I hope all of you to take away with you and explore with your learners, and finally, if time, a look at some useful digital storytelling ideas and tools. So without further ado, let me begin. But let me begin by sharing a story with you. I'll give all of you a very basic listening task. As you listen, see if you can write down the many ways our protagonist is referred to in the story. The idea here is to encourage learners not to repeat themselves too simplistically in their writing. So in my short story, I have avoided repetition as a model example. Let's look at slide three to use a couple of images to get you thinking about the story. Uh. Using images to guess the title of a story is always an effective warm-up with storytelling. Students can then make predictions about what the story might be from these images. It is a common way of grabbing your student's attention and creating an eagerness to see where the story will lead. So this is where you can be involved. Uh, we've got some interesting one comes in. Scared, upset, upset, and scared at the moment is all we've got. If I give you a clue, it might help. Um, let's just say that our teacher is, is frantic, afraid, embarrassed, intimidated. Intimidated is a good one. Um, let's just say that our teacher is very new, he's a new teacher, um, so some sort of cinnamon, um, cinnamon? Uh, some sort of synonym uh, related to being a new teacher. I like intimidated though, it could be intimidated, uh, insecure, he's afraid, young and inexperienced, inexperienced, we've got it. Somebody guessed correctly, so the first adjective I was looking for was inexperienced, well done whoever got that. So this teacher, uh, this story, the first uh, word of the story in the title of the story is inexperienced. So well done. Uh, the next one, I want you to look at the next one and think of one adjective to describe the man in this photo. Um, should be interesting to see what we get from this. Miserable, drunk, sloppy, hungover, straight away. Well done. Okay. So we have accomplished that. The two adjectives I've looking for was, were um, inexperienced and hungover. Okay, so I'm going to read a story which is called Inexperienced and Hungover. Uh, it's a true story. Uh, so, as you listen again, see if you can note down all the ways that the protagonist is referred to. So the main character in the story is always referred to in different ways to avoid repetition. And then you can throw some ideas at me at the end. Okay. So, here is Inexperienced and Hungover, a short story. A few years ago, in a small language school, in the heart of leafy Regent's Park, resided a young, impressionable and inexperienced teacher. One day, after a school pub night hosted by our youthful newcomer, 
our teacher arrived to school hungover and glumly dispirited with his course book that he felt compelled to stick close to. He arrived at school ten minutes before his first lesson was scheduled to begin. His kind-hearted and supportive director of study, known to the staff as Big Mark, rather than Little Mark, who was a few inches shorter, could sense his anxiety, see his puffy red eyes, pale face, and the sweat collecting on his brow, and calmly ushered him into his office and said firmly, Listen, leave your course book in the staff room today and take this list of questions into your class. He handed him the list. The young teacher looked up at him and said in a panic, But what is this? It's a psychological test, Big Mark replied. The callow language teacher, tutor, looked up nervously and said, A psychological test? Why are you giving me a psychological test? Do you think there's something wrong with me? No, don't be silly, replied Mark. The list of questions is for your students, not you. Underneath the questions is an explanation for each one. Get your students to write their responses to each question and later hand out the explanation so they can evaluate each other. You can encourage them before starting to try to use imaginative language which you can put up on the board at the end. Oh, the novice said gently, thank you. Unbeknownst to the 25-year-old, this would be his first storytelling lesson. Not only did the students enjoy it, our English instructor created more lessons around the original prem premise and with future classes. This newly industrious teacher created his own story related to the prompts and began a journey into the furrows of storytelling. It's not, you lose me in the video there. I think the video might be a bit, a bit jittery. I, sort of, I can see myself stopping there. So, that is essentially the story. Can anyone tell me the different ways that this teacher was referred to? I've been told to speak up as well by Mary Ann. I will speak up. Novice, yep, young, tutor, 25 year old, uh, meek and mild, that was interesting. youthful language tutor, youthful newcomer, well done, who got the youthful, youthful newcomer, so newly industrious, well done for that, furrowed brow, Claire Pine, <laughs> um, okay, so, well that teacher, as obvious as it might be, was, was me of course, and I, I, I am now, I can safely say, more experienced fully qualified and rarely drink. Uh, the moral of the story isn't get drunk and go into school and try something different. The moral of the story is try something different even if you're inexperienced. It is my belief that teacher training courses like the CELTA play it very safe. Maybe because they have to, maybe because they only have a short time to get a lot of information across, but from my own experience they don't particularly encourage teachers to be creative. So if you are inexperienced, hungover or not, try to do something different and not rely on your course book. I think that this first lesson is a great place to start. It's simple to do, requires little planning, is very adaptable, creative and thought provoking. There are no right or wrong answers. The evaluation can be interpreted in so many ways so it needn't be too negative. And above all, it's fun. So I think we should do that actual lesson right here, right now or at the very least a shortened version. You will need to open a Word document or grab a pen and paper. Um, I'll just give you half a minute to get yourselves ready. So you'll need to open a separate Word document or grab a piece of paper. Ideally a piece of paper and pen would be great, but uh, you might not have a piece of paper and pen these days. Um, but I'll give you a bit of time to get that ready. So. Some people saying ready, well done, Marta's ready, well done, Marta. Um, Edith Diaz is ready, Michelle, can't pronounce your surname, Michelle, sorry. Yeah, people are ready, they've got their pens or their hands on their keyboards. Okay, I've since lost the original sheet of questions, but I believe that my director of studies had adapted it himself, so any version similar will suffice. I hunted around the internet to find similar tests coming across a blog called A Gripping Life about a writer with a writer. She kept her, her identity anonymous, so I can't unfortunately name her, but thank you. Uh, thank you, memory, uh, and from memory it's close to the original lesson. I've included each question on a separate slide as I go through, in case you miss anything I say. 
So as promised, this is the interactive element of the webinar. So put yourselves in the shoes of your students. Um, I often tell my students to close their eyes as I read out the questions and then to write down the first thing that comes into their heads. I think that's the most effective way to do it. But if you need to check the question again, it will be up on the slide as we go through. Uh, due to time constraints, make your answers short and concise so we can move on to the next prompt. I will give you approximately 45 seconds to a minute for each one, so you need to write pretty quickly and don't write too much. So make sure, you, make sure you're ready. Uh, let's get started after five, five, four, three, two, one. Imagine yourself walking down some sort of path or road. Describe what you see. So number one, imagine yourself walking down some sort of path or road. Describe what you see. Okay. I'm going to give you about 45 seconds to describe what you see. I need to get my time out. Uh -huh. people, are, people are writing down in the chat room what they see, trees in bloom, flowers, sunshine. Um, but if you can write it on uh, a piece of paper or, or a Word doc, that would be better. But I quite like the fact that people are sharing their ideas. Most seem quite positive. Um, someone can see trash, an American word for rubbish. That's not necessarily as positive. Um, OK, we're going to go to the next one. So. The next one is, you come across a key, uh, what does it look like and what do you do with it? So number two, you come across a key, what does it look like and what do you do with it? <laughs> People wailing. Okay, a few more seconds. You say so you've come across a key, and what do you do with it? Okay, let's move on to the next one. Number three, you come across a cup or a container of some sort. What does it look like, and what do you do with it? So you come across a cup or container of some sort. What does it look like and what do you do with it? I'm getting some very funny answers in the um, in the room you can see. Looks like glass. Mm. That's a good one. A glass key. Quite dangerous a glass key. Okay. We're gonna move on to the next one now. Okay, you continue down your path and you see a structure up ahead, a building or a house, for example. Describe what you see and what you do. So you continue down your path and you see a structure up ahead, a building or a house, etc. It could be something else. Describe what you see and do. <laughs> a casino, somebody's book. Somebody again putting glass. An old hut. An old castle with towers and windows. Sorry, I'm probably putting off those trying to think. OK, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, you, continue, you continue on your path and you come across a bear. What is your feeling, interaction, etc., with this bear? So you continue on your path and you come across a bear. What is your feeling, interaction, etc., with this bear? Somebody's put, run! Oh, it depends on the size. I like that. Somebody's put, you know, if it's a small bear, pick it up and give it a cuddle. 
If it's a massive bear, I'll run a mile. Apparently you're not meant to run, are you? That freaks them out. Scream, not a good idea. If you scream. Yeah, it could, yeah, somebody's put a teddy bear question mark. It could it could it could be a teddy bear. It's up to you. Um I'd say dead. I, I would give him a cuddle. Oh, very sweet. Okay. Let's move to the next one. Some of you are writing in the chat room, some of you are writing on Word documents. It, it doesn't matter. I think being in the chat box is quite fun. Okay. Next one, you come to an obstacle in your path. What is it and what do you do? So you come to an obstacle in your path. What is it and what do you do? Somebody's across, come, somebody's, uh, comes across a cow. Perhaps they're in India. That happens quite regularly. Um, okay, so the last one, I believe. Finally, what is behind the obstacle on the other side? Describe what you see and feel. So the last one is, what is behind the obstacle on the other side? Describe what you see and how you feel. We've got some nice paradise, freedom, a beautiful beach, paradise. There's a bench, hmm. a pub, and I feel great. An amazing restful lake, my school. Uh, another bear, oh dear. Another bear, somebody found a strawberry field. Mm. A strawberry field, or a field of strawberries, perhaps. Um, so, now that you have either written your answers in the chat box, or on a piece of paper, or on a Word document, or in many different ways, or maybe you've even been tweeting your answers, who knows, um, here is the evaluation. You can have a read through that. I'm going to give you about a minute or so just to skim read that and see what you think. And at the bottom, um, oh no, I'm not at the, at the bottom of this slide, there isn't the question. Let me just, uh, I will ask you the question at the end. So have a read through first. Uh, will, will we get the slides? Yes, you will. Lotta has just asked, will you get the slides? So, so as you're reading the evaluation, um, the answer guide here, I want to ask you all a question, um, a yes or no question, just so we can get an idea of what your opinion is of this kind of thing. Well, not really your opinion, whether you believe it's true or not. So the question is, do you think, you're, do you think the test is accurate? Do you think, well, let, let's, let's, let's reiterate, let's, 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 let's change that, sorry. Do you think your answers are accurate? We've got a big no there. No, not sure. Yes, yes. No, 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 not really. Not sure, not sure, not really. Maybe. Yes, and I'm so proud. Ha. <laughs> Pretty much. At least 85% accurate, some people. So very, very mixed responses. No, Sophia thinks no. A lot of people, as I think the most common answer is not sure. Well, to be honest, it doesn't really matter. Um, I just think this is a, a nice, a nice lesson. And uh, in my experience, this was uh, this was the first sort of storytelling lesson I did as an inexperienced teacher. And from this, I started to pick up lots of ideas very sort of naturally. Um, uh, a nice follow-on from this point, if you do this with a, with a uh, group of students, is to ask the students to pass their answers to another student who can then use that information to write a complete short story. And they can later, they, they can later then read these stories in small groups. It's a great way of sharing ideas, imagination, and language. I think most people are quite cynical about these tests. Um, I'm not sure I'm a believer, um, but it's a nice starting point for getting the kind of creative juices flowing. Okay. So, let's move on. This lesson and other story lessons are very simple to orchestrate. The crucial thing here is to never be intimidated by storytelling. There, there are, 
some teaching ideas that would, of course, be elevated if you were a professional storyteller. The primary school that I work in, uh, where I teach Spanish, source professional storytellers who often bring in props, use exaggerated gesticulation, songs, and musical instruments. And the kids genuinely love and respond wonderfully to them. But as you'll see as we go on and look at lesson examples, using storytelling in the classroom doesn't require you to be a professional performer. As an EFL teacher, you are probably using many more gestures and facial expressions than you imagine. So capturing the attention of your learners is something you do inherently every day. So telling fictional stories in an enthusiastic way should just be a rite of passage for most of us. If you really feel that you cannot tell a captivating story alone, try a form of digital storytelling. You can use sound, music, photos, a PowerPoint slide, animations, video content, if you wish. By introducing any of these forms of media, you'll bring your story to life and also encourage your students to, to do the same when it's their turn to be storytellers. OK, we're going to move on now to history. You can see a little slide there. So the history of storytelling, well, it's been around forever. So how did it all begin? I did promise in my abstract a brief history of storytelling in EFL. But like in general education, storytelling, it seems, has always been around. Its history is ancient, lost in the mist of time. Nobody knows when the first story was actually told. Did it happen in the gloomy recess, recess of a cave around a flickering fire told by a primitive hunter? Well, we may never know. It is commonly considered the oldest form of teaching in and, it, and in EFL, it's always been there. Alongside drama techniques, it became very popular in the 60s and 70s in an era that saw the birth of total physical response and the, communic the communicative approach. And then to the 80s in Krashen's natural approach. Storytelling has been championed by the likes of Alan Maley and Mario Ringvalukri and a number of other EFL practitioners and writers. It's clearly been an element of English language teaching as far back as anyone can really remember, and is scattered across a wide range of published material that are both theoretical and practical. In fact, storytelling has its roots in what has become an entirely original teaching method called TPRS, which stands for Teaching Proficiency Through Reading and Storytelling. I don't have time to go into any detail about TPRS, but it's worth reading up on, and you can follow the link on the next slide for more information at the end of the webinar. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Again, there have been questions about the slides. They will be sent to you um, after the webinar. So, this is a Ring Mario Ringvalukri quote. My claim is that storytelling is a uniquely powerful linguistic and psychological technique in the hands of a language teacher which she or he can use with people of any culture and with people of virtually any age. Mario is certainly one of the most recognized champions of storytelling in the EFL, and it's also worth reading the article, uh, which is linked here at the bottom of the slide. But this quote, if I can say briefly, is a further point worth raising that storytelling is often seen by many people as a method as a technique to use with children and young learners. But it, I believe it's truly relevant with all age groups. Um, there's a lovely story in a book called The Element by author, speaker, and international advisor on education, Ken Robinson, about a school in America that wanted to improve their reading hour each week by taking their children into a different environment. And across the road from the school, there was an old people's home. So one day, it was arranged the teachers would take their children into the foyer of the hospice for reading hour. Before long, by the second week, some of the residents started to peer into the reading session and were, were becoming intrigued by the sounds of stories and children. A few weeks later, they had paired up every child with an elderly resident. And so it goes, literacy standards reached an all-time high. I'm just going to click to the next slide. Reached an all-time high and medication in the hospice practically halved. It is a great example of how stories bridge generations and how universally engaging and satisfying sharing stories can be. Let's just do a very quick poll question. 
So you're going to have to answer yes or no to this. It's probably quite obvious what your answers will be. But did you have stories read to you as a child? Choose yes or no. Of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. Yes, yes. Oh, very often, yes. Can't recall. Oh, we have a no. We have one no. I won't mention the name. It's coming very quickly. So, as you can see, most of you have read stories. So, I guess the thing is, in a sense, bringing storytelling into an adult environment can be very powerful, evocative and nostalgic tool for, for some learners who come from more rigid educational systems, it may be that they haven't enjoyed stories in such a way since they were children, and this can have very interesting results. There seems to be a gap in some educational systems between, when it, between sort of uh, young, young education and then adult education. Stories kind of get lost in the middle, which I think is something that is a bit of a shame. Um, but even if it does happen, the results are interesting. So. This brings us on to the benefits of storytelling. So there's quite a hefty list in the next slide, uh, as you can see. So things to think about. Uh, universal, of course. We've just talked about that. So every age, uh, every culture is interested in stories. I've been reading to my three kids for 16 years. Well done, Kelly. Um, sorry. I got distracted by the chat box. I've got to ignore the chat box for a while. Motivating and fun. So yeah, stories are fun and they are motivating. That's an obvious one. Exercise the imagination. So whether you're a child or an adult, listening to a story, listening to a storyteller um, is, a, is, a, is a very imaginative process. There's lots, there's lots of cognitive things going on. Uh, social experience. Listening to stories in groups is definitely a fun social experience. You can look around at the classroom and see how people are reacting. Uh, yeah, that's great. Repetition of language. OK, so if you are telling a story to your group of students, you can keep using the same language, the same adjective or function or grammatical structure so that they're hearing that language repeated again and again. Introduction of new language. Well. If you're telling a story for the first time, a story that you've written or a story from a book, uh, you can introduce new language there that you can focus on at the end of the story being told. Uh, revision of language. So if you're doing a course and you want to go over language that's been covered on the course, you can include that language in your story. So it's a great way, it's a great way of inputting language. A welcome break from the usual. Okay, I don't, I don't believe that you should be telling stories 24-7 the whole time. Um, there are, there is obviously room for other things, but it's a great break and it's quite, it's relaxing. Uh, no need for much planning, as you can see from the previous lesson. Really, all you needed there was a list of questions about the psychological test. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. That's very true. It encourages reading and writing. Uh, stretches students' linguistic capacities. Uh, chances students to be creative. Um, you can explore new tools in, for digital storytelling, which we're going to have a quick look at at the end. Um, and shyer students can use these tools if they're, if they're not natural performers and don't want to stand up in front of the class. Um, uh, they can use other means to entertain and tell their stories. Uh, the, effect, the, the effective filter is lessened. Obviously, Crashen's effective filter uh, with uh, you know, students being stressed. Storytelling is a wonderful way of just creating a relaxing, fun atmosphere. And the last one is my favourite, is memorable. I think learning language through stories is memorable. And I think that's the most important thing about it. Um, those are just a few. Uh, there's a little question that, they, that some of you have already picked up on, on that slide, which says, can you add to this list? If you think you can add to this list, please do. Enriches the language and is unthreatening. It's very nice. Ismay, thank you. It's cheap. I will always remember about the bear. Okay. Uh, develops listening skills. Yeah, it's creative. Yeah, it helps students to develop emotional intelligence. Absolutely. Very nice. Thank you, Irina. Interpersonal skills, learning life or personal lessons. There is a sense of community when you tell a story. Very nice. Student stories are personalized. Yeah, personalization is great. Prevents boredom. Um, relays culture. Absolutely. Very engaging. 
creative, encourage creativity. I've, I've noticed that really creativity is, is, is the most common one. And I, I completely agree. And that's really essentially what the, what the webinar is about. OK, let's move on now. So let's move on to some lesson ideas. So the options here are endless. Most of the lessons, some that I have created, others I cite are easy to do. They're very adaptable. And any, are all, any or all are a very good starting point for teachers that are new to storytelling. You'll most probably, like I did, soon realize that you have naturally taught in this way even before you look into things more deeply. So let's go through a few lesson examples. We'll start with storytelling lessons. And we'll start with listening lessons. So really, this is the teacher um, doing most of the speaking. But these lessons can then turn into speaking activities for the students as well. So let's go to the first one. Gap fill storytelling. OK. Quite a pop. Uh, this is a straightforward lesson. Um, you choose an interesting, uh, <coughs> you choose an interesting short story, or you can write your own. Uh, when I've written my own stories in the past, I've used the names of my students, which can often be a lot of a lot of fun, and another method to getting them listening. Above all, choose a relevant subject for your group of learners. Then, from that story, choose a few chunks of language. You can put them on the board, on separate sheets around the room or you, you could give one chunk of language to each student. Before you read your story, go through and elicit the meaning of the language. Once you feel the class is familiar with the meaning of these phrases, read aloud the, read aloud the story, stopping at points where the language you've given to the class goes, and asking them to fill the gaps by choosing the correct chunk of language. Sometimes you may want to write a story around language that you've been covering, or you may want to introduce brand new language. So gap fill storytelling, pretty simple to do. Dictogloss. I discovered Dictogloss when I, when I did my diploma, and I've used it regularly since. I've always found it very effective, and it makes for a great storytelling lesson. For those new to Dictogloss, don't worry, as it is, again, relatively straightforward. It's a form of dictation, but slightly different in that a story or a piece of text is read aloud to the class three times, sometimes four, if you really see your learners struggling. The story should be short, roughly one to two paragraphs, and depending on the level of your students, sorry, depending on, depending on the level of the students, tell your students to just listen to the first, the first time you read it. Then on the second read, start writing down content words that spring out to them, and largely ignoring function words. And the third and final time, students can start to put the content words into a logical order. Their task is to now reconstruct the story in pairs or small groups with a chosen scribe. At this point, you can monitor closely and see where students are having difficulty with grammar and function words. You can, board, you can put on the board good pieces of language and language that needs improving at the end. So try a dictogloss. Number three now. A personal anecdote. We all tell anecdotes to our students. Preparing them into lessons and inputting language requires a little bit of planning. New teachers are often overly conscious about talking too much. But you're more interesting to your learners than you imagine. In many cases, your students want to emulate the way that you speak, pronounce, and intonate. So use your voice when you can. Telling a funny, shocking, sad, sentimental, embarrassing anecdote will capture your students' attention. You can make the listening more dynamic by handing out a few titles for the anecdote around the class. At the end of your anecdote, they could decide on what the best title should be. You could ask your students to decide if the anecdote is true or false, or that they can interrogate you at the end. You could ask your students to make a note of certain language that they hear, from narrative tenses to expressions or idioms to adjectives or verbs and so on. My favorite course book series is, is called Inside Out, which I'm sure Macmillan will be pleased to know. And across all the levels in this series are anecdote tasks. Students prepare anecdotes working from a list of questions to prompt ideas. So if you need any ideas for your own anecdotes, you can look at this series, Inside Out. Next one is a gestured tale. OK, this is the fun, this is the fun one, I think. Gestures, facial expressions, scribbling, often terrible doodles on the board 
are all things as language teachers that we heavily rely on to elicit language from our learners, but we can use any of these in a more orchestrated fashion to help tell a story, to help our students to understand new language as it is being heard to them. Choose or write a story with language you can easily express through mime, gesture or facial expression. Practice the gestures on another teacher to make sure you're making yourself well understood. If at times your gestures are up to interpretation, this can cause lively debate, so keep such gestures part of your story. As you tell or read aloud your story, stop at each piece of language and use a gesture asking your students to guess the word, phrase or chunk of language. If you don't feel confident to do this, you could use images as an alternative to gestures and mime. Let's move on now to storytelling lessons productive. So this is uh, really to get your students speaking and writing. The first one is listening to sound. This is something I'm going to explore in more detail at this year's IATEFL in Liverpool. Uh, we are visually heavy in classrooms, from the colourful posters on the walls to the common use of whiteboards, and interactive whiteboards, image heavy course books, flashcards, realia and so on, but we don't often make much use of sound. The sounds in our local environments, sound effects we can create using our space and bodies, music and in the case of the materials that me and James write, recorded sound effects and soundscapes. Sound triggers the imagination and is an ideal stimulus for storytelling. A great book called Sounds Intriguing by Alan Maley demonstrates that you can create a sequence of sounds as a teacher in your classroom space. Ask your students to close their eyes and walk around the class making sounds. Pulling chairs from under desks, slamming doors, humming, laughing, clapping, scratching, any sound that you deem to be appropriate. As they listen to them, ask them to imagine a scene. Once you've finished and hopefully spotted, <laughs> and hopefully not being spotted by your line manager, ask your learners to write down what they imagined into a short story. Another way of using sound is what I like to call video blind. Take a YouTube video and play the sound, but don't allow the students to see the screen. Unnarrated film trailers are ideal for this, or you could turn a TV to face away from the students to listen to and imagine the scene. The main idea is to make students listen to sounds without visuals, so keeping their eyes shut is a great help. There's a lovely project in the UK called A Minute of Listening, which is an initiative to encourage young children to listen to sounds. And due to time constraints, I, don't, I can't go into much detail about it beyond, the, beyond that the project is about creative responses to sound. There is a link at the bottom of the slide uh, which you can follow for more information. Other ideas include pairing students up, one blindfolded, the other the guide to walk around the school, noting what sounds they hear, and then putting those sounds into a narrative back in the classroom. And then, of course, there is the use of music, uh, which, again, due to time constraints, I'm not going to go into much detail today, but I will be talking about it um, in Liverpool for those coming to IATEFL. So, I've just said that we use images a lot, so let's go to using images. Next one. Perhaps the most common way of stimulating stories is the use of images. And there are an endless amount of things we can do as teachers. Students can draw a sequence of images on the board and then use these images to write stories. You can give your students comic strips, a sequence of photos, a short silent video, the beginning of a short film for students to write their own endings to. The options are endless. Storytelling dice, and I've got a little example here that I've been using with my, with my teenagers. I don't know if you can see it very clearly. Be blurred. Yeah, magic and fairy tale dice. Uh, you can look it up on Amazon. You might be able to get that delivered to you. They're quite good fun. Um, you basically throw a set of different dice that have different images on them. And that helps. That becomes a stimulus for telling the stories. I think they're really good fun. They're quite good fun just to do with friends. With students, it's ideal, especially teenagers. Seem to really enjoy it. Um, OK, let's move on from images to 
contextualizing language. Okay, so another effective way of getting your students to write stories is giving them information to contextualize, such as a character breakdown, a theme, a crucial piece of plot, even a short synopsis for them to use to write or present their own stories. They can also contextualize certain pieces of language that, you've been, that have been covered during their course, from grammatical structures to, lex to lexis to functions. All of these can be used in their stories with the chance to go over form, meaning, use, and pronunciation once again. A digital tale. A digital tale, OK. The modern student is predominantly becoming more modern than us as teachers. And with elements such as timelines on Facebook that give a narrative to our profiles without us having much say, and with Twitter feeds taking on actual conversation, it's very normal to think of storytelling in a digital form. Therefore, any project that involves your students creating a story with tools, with photos, images, slideshows, music, sound, video, is a great way to infuse them, to tell stories because it's happening in their lives and all around them. Students can create stories around dialogues and text messages. They can flash up, they can flash up on screen photos from their Facebook accounts and retell actual events. They can make short videos that become part of their stories. They can create a playlist of music that means a lot to them and retell the times and stories related to those songs. The options are endless. So we finally arrived at our natural present day point, digital storytelling. Digital storytelling, okay. So let me just move to the next slide. Digital storytelling is the modern expression of the ancient art of storytelling. Throughout history, storytelling has been used to share knowledge, wisdom, and values. Stories have taken many different forms. Stories have been adapted to each successive medium that has emerged, from the circle of the campfire to the silver screen, and now the computer screen. So there are literally thousands of tools available. And rather than list each one, I thought I would share a very useful link, which you can look at in more detail at the end of the webinar. It's on the next slide. It's Shelley Terrell, it's Shelley Terrell's blog, and she's definitely the expert when it comes to digital, digital storytelling. I merely wanted to point out in this webinar that digital storytelling, in essence, is a natural progression of storytelling. I think the kinds of tools available can be really interesting. And by setting tasks around the online tools and applications, you can also create task-based lessons, just getting the students to work collaboratively to understand how they work. Well, that's certainly all we have time for at this stage. I hope that the webinar has got you thinking about storytelling and its creative potential. So please go off and explore, and please keep in touch. My final slide is for those coming to IATEFL in Liverpool this year. I'm running a workshop uh, called Using Sound as a Creative Stimulus for Language Learning. It's on the Tuesday, the 9th of April, uh, roughly around 3 p.m. And it's a 45-minute workshop. So hopefully, some of you who, um, I know that there's people from all over the globe at this um, webinar, perhaps won't be able to make it. but others will, uh, perhaps we'll get a chance to meet and share some stories there. So my final slide today before I go is just my contact details again where I'd like to continue this dialogue with all of you. Uh, you can tweet me um, at LLE Luke. Uh, you can become a friend of mine on Facebook if you like at LLE Luke. And my email address is luke at londonlanguageexperience.com. So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you have a lovely rest of your week. I am now going to pass you on to our technical moderator, uh, Henry, or AKA 